This video was made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Subscribe on Patreon for early access to videos and additional content. Given the lack of modern technology, standards, and protocols that we use today, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it must have been easy in the Victorian era to get away with the most unforgivable crimes. Although there are many mysteries from this time period, such as the true identity of the infamous Jack the Ripper, there are many terrifying criminals who slipped up and ultimately got caught. In today's episode of Cold Case Detective, we'll be exploring two chilling cases of Victorian serial killers. Maria Swannenberg Born November 9th, 1839, Maria Katerina van der Linden Swannenberg is one of the most notable serial killers to emerge from the Netherlands, although admittedly, her infamy was short-lived. Not much has been documented about Maria's upbringing, other than that her father was a man named Clemens Swannenberg, and her mother was named Joanna. The couple had Maria while living in Leiden, in the province of South Holland, and were not particularly wealthy. In fact, Maria spent most of her life living in squalid conditions, like the majority of the working class in the 1800s. She had 11 siblings, but only four reached adulthood, and her father worked long hours at a factory, often only having one day off a week. Maria married her first husband, Johan van der Linden, on May 13th, 1868. Prior to the couple getting together, the young woman had birthed two daughters, but tragically had lost both in their infancy. During Maria's marriage to Johan, however, she had five healthy sons and two more daughters. Eventually, however, the union disintegrated after almost 20 years. Maria was widely known in her community as a caring, generous, and good-natured woman. She would babysit the local children, tend to the sick, and carry out household chores for the frail and elderly. She appeared to be a true pillar of the community, but it wasn't long before this perfect image began to crumble. It was believed that Maria's crimes began in 1880, and unlike some serial killers who perhaps slowly escalate their offenses, the Dutch woman began with one of the most heinous crimes one could carry out. She took the life of her own mother in cold blood. Shortly afterwards, Maria poisoned her father. Although there is little recorded detail about Maria's victims, many of them were her relatives. In total, she is suspected of poisoning over 65 people, and this is believed to have led to the death of at least 23 of them. Maria's weapon of choice was arsenic, a tasteless poison that could be slipped into the food and drink of her victims. It was easy to purchase at the time, as it was used for taking care of vermin, and produced symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, muscle cramps, and red and swollen skin. The motive behind the young woman's horrific crimes was financial. Maria often took out life insurance policies on her victims, at a time where it was possible to take out several at once on one person. From here, she would orchestrate their demise, and then collect the money. However, there has been more debate about Maria's motives. Some people have speculated that perhaps she was simply driven by a desire to kill. After all, despite the amount of money she collected, she continued to live in poor conditions. It's been postulated that perhaps the crime started for financial gain, but swiftly spiraled into something darker. It was reported that she was so brazen about her crimes that she wants poisoned people who are attending a funeral by putting arsenic in their coffee. Maria's crimes were uncovered in December of 1883, when she was caught attempting to poison the Frank Husen family by slipping arsenic into their dinner. The mother of the family and one child sadly passed away, although the other members of the family, including the father, survived. Leiden police became suspicious of how many people died in Maria's care, 
and conducted an extensive investigation, in which dozens of local residents, family members, and others were spoken with. They even managed to talk to possible suppliers of the arsenic. The investigation was so thorough and in-depth that it took over a year and a half to complete. 13 of her victims' bodies were excavated and examined. Now, it may seem like it would be obvious to notice that a serial poisoner was walking the streets, but given the high death rates in the area anyway, and the poor living conditions of those who died, it wasn't immediately obvious that something was amiss. Leiden, in general during this period, was a poverty-stricken city where workers barely managed to stay afloat. Maria's trial began on April 23rd, 1885, where she was subsequently found guilty of three murders. Her story had become a spectacle internationally, and her name quickly became one that was feared. The local community was shocked that a woman they'd once considered the epitome of kindness was now revealed as a killer. While awaiting trial, Maria was moved to a jailhouse for protection as she was almost lynched by angry, upset mobs. Two doctors were ordered to examine her to determine her mental state, and both agreed that Maria was in full possession of her mental faculties. She was sentenced to life imprisonment in a correctional facility where she lived until her death in 1915. In June of 1885, she had attempted to appeal her conviction, but this attempt at regaining her freedom was rejected. Although her name has since faded into obscurity, Maria was once known globally for her gruesome and chilling crimes. In recent years, a brand of gin has emerged from Leiden, using Maria's photograph and her nickname as their branding. She also inspired a bakery chain located in the Netherlands to create a bagel in her name. It would seem that advertisers in her own country and their fascination with the macabre have kept her name and infamy alive. Mary Ann Cotton. It's been almost 150 years since Mary Ann Cotton was hanged for her heartless crimes, but even still, in Britain, her name is synonymous with evil. Born on Halloween of 1832 in County Durham, Mary Ann Robson had a fairly unextraordinary upbringing. Her father, Michael, was a coal miner who had married her mother, Margaret, at an extremely young age. Although her father worked hard, Mary Ann's parents could barely make ends meet. The children were reportedly brought up in a strict religious environment and were expected to enter the workforce as soon as possible. Mary Ann did not have a positive relationship with her father, but appeared to be a good student. Although she struggled to make friends, her teachers reported that she was a, quote, most exemplary and regular attender, and a girl of innocent disposition and average intelligence. Mary Ann was the oldest of two children. A younger sister was born in 1834, but she only lived a few months, while her younger brother, Robert, was born in 1835 and appeared to make it to adulthood, something that wasn't commonplace at the time. When Mary Ann was eight, her parents moved to the village of Merton, still in County Durham. It was here that her father died after falling 150 feet down a mine shaft in 1842. Since his job was tied to the family home, Margaret and the children were evicted and lived in extreme poverty for some time until the family met a miner named George Stott who married Margaret in 1843. According to most reports, Mary Ann did not have a better relationship with her stepfather and disliked him just as much as she did her own, now deceased, biological parents. Desperate to leave the family home, Mary Ann took off for the village of South Hetton when she was 16. She studied to become a nurse and returned home three years later, where she began to train as a dressmaker. In 1852, Aged 20, Mary Ann married a laborer named William Mowbray. The couple moved to the southwest of England, where they are believed to have had four or five children together, all of whom died young. At this time, birth registrations were mandatory but not enforced, meaning there is no record of these children. 
They had a daughter whose birth was recorded, called Margaret Jane, who passed away at age four. The following year, the couple had another daughter who they also named Margaret Jane. Their son, John Roberts, was born in 1863, but died one year later from gastric fever. In January of 1865, William died suddenly from an intestinal disorder. His widow, Mary Ann, collected his life insurance, which was worth 35 pounds, the equivalent of around 4,400 pounds in today's money. She also collected two pounds for the demise of her son, roughly around 250 pounds today. Shortly after her husband's passing, Mary Ann moved to Seam Harbor, County Durham, where she met a man named Joseph Natras. The couple became lovers, but Joseph was due to be married and was either unwilling or unable to break off the engagement. So the pair parted ways. After the breakdown of her relationship with Joseph, Mary Ann moved to Sunderland, where she took up employment as a nurse at the House of Recovery for the Cure of Contagious Fever, Dispensary, and Humane Society. It was here that she met an engineer named George Ward, whom she married on August 28th of 1865. Although already in poor health, George's doctors were surprised when he took a turn for the worst the following year and passed away on October 20th, of 1866. He had suffered from paralysis and intestinal problems, although his death was recorded as being caused by English cholera and typhoid. Mary Ann quickly collected on his life insurance policy. Less than a month later, following George's death, Mary Ann became employed as a housekeeper by a shipwright named James Robinson, who was a recent widower. A month into her employment, James found his baby dead from gastric fever. He sought comfort in Mary Ann, who became pregnant. Around this time, the expectant mother was made aware that her own mother had become ill with hepatitis back home, and so she returned to her. Soon after, her mother began suffering intense stomach pain. Just nine days later in the spring of 1867, she passed away. Mary Ann's stepfather went on to marry his widowed neighbor later that year. Upon returning to James, Mary Ann brought along her only surviving child, Isabella. It wasn't long before the child developed stomach pains and passed away, along with two of James's own children. The supposedly grieving mother collected an insurance payout of five pounds, the equivalent of around 632 pounds in today's money. James and Mary Ann married on August 11th that year, and their first child was born a few months later in November. However, she only survived a few months. The couple's second child, George, was born June 18th, 1869. The pair's marriage was anything but blissful though, and the cracks quickly began to show. James became suspicious when Mary Ann insisted that he take out a life insurance policy. He also found out that behind his back, she'd managed to rack up 60 pounds or 7,500 pounds today in debt, and that she'd stolen the modern day equivalent of 6,323 pounds that she'd been expected to bank. Upon speaking with his children, James discovered that Mary Ann had been forcing them to pawn household valuables and return the money to her. Furious, he threw out his new wife. He retained custody of their son, George. Mary Ann was left desolate. She had no money and was in the last position that she wanted to be in. Then things changed when she met Frederick Cotton, who was the brother of one of her friends. Frederick was a pitman and a widow who was living in Walbottle, Northumberland with two children. Since his wife died, Frederick's children were often cared for by Mary's friend, who was sort of their mother figure. In March of 1870, Mary's friend passed away from an undetermined stomach ailment, leaving an opening for Mary Ann to make her move. She consoled Frederick, looked after his children, and shortly after became pregnant. The pair were bigamously married in 1870, as Mary Ann was still at this point married to James. The couple's first son, Robert, was born in early 1871. 
However, not long after the pair married, Mary Ann learned that Joseph Natras, her former lover who had been engaged last time they met, was now living just 30 miles away in the village of West Auckland and, much to her delight, was no longer married. She was quick to rekindle the flame and gave her family reasons why they should move to the village, which they did. Frederick was the next victim of Mary Ann's, passing away in December of 1870 from gastric fever. Afterwards, Joseph became her lodger, but her attention was caught by somebody else when she began working as a nurse to an officer and became pregnant with his child. Meanwhile, Frederick's son, Frederick Jr., died in March of 1872, and Robert passed away soon after. Joseph also met his demise soon after revising his will, to make sure it included Mary Ann. Things finally began to unravel that year, when Mary Ann complained about Frederick Cotton's remaining child, Charles, to a parish official named Thomas Riley. She claimed he was standing in the way of her marriage to the man whose child she was carrying, and asked if Charles could be committed to a workhouse, but was told that she would have to accompany him, which was out of the question, as far as Mary Ann was concerned. She replied that he was sickly and noted, quote, I won't be troubled long. He'll go, like all the rest of the Cottons. It is unclear why she made this incriminating statement, but it seems likely that she became overconfident because she'd gotten away with murder for so long. Five days later, Mary Ann told Thomas Riley that Charles had passed away. As assistant coroner, Riley was immediately suspicious and went to the police. He convinced the doctor to delay writing the death certificate. When Mary Ann went to collect the insurance payout, she was told she would not receive the money without a death certificate. An inquest was held, but returned a verdict of natural causes, while Mary Ann alleged that Riley was making accusations against her because she'd rejected his romantic advances. This might have been where the story ended if it wasn't for the newspapers who caught wind of the story and subsequently started digging for information. They found out that Mary Ann was prone to moving around the country and was surrounded by tragedy. Over the years, she'd lost three husbands, a lover, a friend, a mother, and 11 children, all of whom had died in similar circumstances. Riley continued to push for testing on Charles. His body had been buried, but the coroner kept several body parts. They revealed traces of arsenic, confirming that he had not died by natural causes, but that he'd been poisoned. As a result of this breakthrough, Marianne was finally arrested and charged with his murder. Marianne's trial was delayed until she birthed her 13th child, who was adopted as an infant by another couple. The father of her baby didn't waste time and severed all ties with her after hearing about what she was accused of. When the trial began on March 5th of 1873, Mary Ann's defense claimed that Charles had died from inhaling arsenic used in the dye of the green wallpaper in the Cotton family home. This wasn't unbelievable, given that arsenic was commonly used in household items at the time, but the jury did not buy the defense's argument and returned a guilty verdict after just 90 minutes. Mary Ann had been scheduled for another hearing concerning Joseph, Frederick Jr. and Robert Cotton, all of whom were found to have died from poisoning after their bodies were exhumed, but this went no further after her first conviction, where she was sentenced to death. Upon hearing her sentencing, Mary Ann attempted to clear her name and begged for help from her husband, James Robinson, to whom she wrote many letters. She also blamed him for abandoning her. Mary Ann Cotton was hanged on March 24th of 1873 in Durham County. However, her hanging was botched and she was ultimately strangled to death by the rope. Her 13th child, Margaret Edith, who was adopted, lived until 1954. Her son, George, whom she'd had with James Robinson, also survived. Mary Ann never confessed to any other murders, although she is believed to have killed 21 people, including 15 family members. She was dubbed the Dark Angel after her crimes came to light. She is often referred to as Britain's first female serial killer, although this is untrue. 
She is perhaps, however, one of the most infamous and most terrifying. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon for access to additional behind the scenes content and a host of other bonus content besides. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.